I would like to welcome everybody to the um, sixth in our series um, of the World Kamishibai Forum. And this is an auspicious day for all of us because it also happens to be the uh, world storytelling um, celebration around the world. So this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to talk about Kamishibai storytelling in particular. Uh, we have a lot of um, really interesting panelists today, so um, I want to introduce everybody. But before I, I do that, I would like to remind everyone um, to direct your questions as you think of them into the um, Q&A, and uh, also we'll be monitoring the chat. So um, please, as you think of things, keep um, adding to uh, your questions. We do have a few questions ahead of time, so I will um, be responding to those as well. One of the questions, I'll share my screen so I can show you, uh, came from April Cochran in Kentucky, and she was asking about where she can purchase um, Kamishibai cards. So I wanted to remind everybody um, on the World Kamishibai Forum website, um, you can see all the archived videos uh, and webinars that we've done so far. Um, and if you scroll all the way down, it's a very long page to scroll down. You will get to, after our schedule, um, Kamishibai resources worldwide. Uh, so we are trying to collect, it's still not a complete list by any means, but we have Kamishibai stories, equipment, um, and service and advice. And we invite people to send in information to add to these pages. But if you click here, um, it will go to a list of publishers from around the world. Um, so uh, we also wanted to add that Doshinsha, um, there was one question about whether um, their uh, cards were available from other sources and they do also distribute their cards um, through Japanese bookstores. So if there's a Kinokuniya or some sort of Japanese bookstore near you, um, you should be able to order their cards directly. Um, so that was one question we received already. Um, and I also just wanna let everybody know that uh, because our um, webinar next month in April, on April 17th, uh, we'll have presenters from Europe. We are going to try to accommodate their time frame. Um, and have the um, webinar at a different time. It will be at 1 p.m. on the West Coast, 4 p.m. on the East Coast of the U.S. And that would be 10 p.m. in Europe instead of 2.30 or whatever it is for them right now. Um, so I just wanted to let you know we'll be changing the time. Okay, well, I think we have all of our... Yes. I'm sorry, before we... we um, uh turn off this page. Um, Oops, sorry. Um, you wanted, wanted, to wanted to mention that uh, our presenter last month, Flavia Wolfowitz from Brazil, her name is not on this, um, in this section yet, but she has uh, very generously offered to um, share her the illustrations and the text to her Kamishibai story called Land of Hope mm -hmm. about Brazilian, the Japanese immigration to Brazil. And so if you are interested in, um, she set it up so you can download the illustrations and the text. Mm -hmm. So right. we'll, put, we'll put her uh, name on this list later. Right. And also Pepe, um, our friend from um, Peru has also, um, designed this very beautiful Kamishibai stage. Um, and he has begun selling that also. Uh, and it does accommodate the Japanese size Kamishibai cards. So we'll put information about that, how to um, order that or get um, specifics about it on this page also. So please check back. Um, if you're yes. interested. Please check back um, because we will be adding to this and um, please send in more information if there's anything we're missing here. As you can see, we are focusing today on um, the United States publishers in the United States, Kamishibai for Kids and Story Card Theater. Um, so I will um, now share my 
PowerPoint. I have to find it. Hold on. Um, to introduce everybody. So um, we are going to be focusing on publishing Kamishibai in the US and Kamishibai in American museums and libraries. And our presenters today come from the, most, the farthest points on either side of the coast, um, on the West Coast and um, the East Coast. Uh, oh, Tara, it's, yeah. not on, it's not on the screen. Oh, we're really? Still, we're still huh. looking at the... I think I have to maybe stop there and start again. How's that? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Better. Okay. <laughs> all right, great. So um, first of all, I want to introduce uh, Bob and Margaret Eisenstadt, who really don't need any introduction. Um, they uh, are in New York and uh, they have um, for the last more than 20 years from 1992, um, been providing kamishibai cards in English and Japanese. Um, Bob and Margaret uh, have also been spreading kamishibai throughout the U.S. in various um, conferences. And uh, 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 Donna Tamaki, who is present here, um, co-founded kamishibai for kids with Margaret. And in between them here sitting, um, uh, and having done many of the illustrations on the website is our friend uh, Egoro Futamata. Um, and uh, many people know of his illustrations for the, the uh, mountain witch, um, the three magic charms or, or the um, mountain witch who was eaten up. So this is their website. They have many resources on it. And um, Erica Siskind, who's also one of our panelists today, was kind enough to suggest that I share with you. Um, they also have my book, The Kamishibai Classroom, available on their selections, if you go to their selections, <laughs> um, for a, a discounted price. So um, she wanted me to mention that. Um, this is a book I, I wrote to um, for teachers and storytellers and anybody who wants to create kamishibai uh, with children. It's more expensive on Amazon. Just exactly. So I, I wanted to um, follow through on your suggestion there. Um, and yes, I want to welcome Erica. Um, I have not met her in person, um, but I have heard a lot about her. And um, Walter uh, actually met her in Japan. They both went to a Doshinsha Ikaja workshop um, for Kamishibai. So that is how I learned about her work. She's a librarian in Oakland, California. And as you can see in the background, um, does Kamishibai performances, oops, sorry. And um, also has uh, done workshops for teachers and has worked with Elizabeth Overmeyer who um, introduced, Erica introduced Elizabeth to us. Elizabeth has been doing workshops at the um, Asian Museum of Art in San Francisco. And uh, so they can share the librarian and uh, museum experiences in the US. Um, and finally, uh, we wanted also to have the perspective of Hazuki and David Batino, who are also publishing story card theater in the um, Bay Area near um, in Folsom, California, a little bit farther inland. Um, so Hazuki and David uh, have this story card theater store uh, and they will tell us more about, um, they, their video really introduces beautifully how they have um, developed the, these stories that they have um, available in their, on their website. Um, and it's interesting for me to finally meet them online because <laughs> I actually uh, wrote about them and Walter in my book, Performing Kamishibai and Emerging New Literacy for a Global Audience. <laughs> I was looking for examples of how Kamishibai was spreading around the world. And, um, I thought it would be useful to take a moment to look at this um, graph that I uh, translated. It's by um, Tsunekatsu Suzuki, who has shown how there are different forms of kamishibai even within Japan. So um, David and Hazuki mentioned gaito kamishibai and educational kamishibai as the two forms of kamishibai. Um, but actually there are, are many sort of interrelated formats. And so he mentions that street performance art 
is also connected to the handmade or tezukuri kamishibai movement. Um, and that all of these um, sort of intersect with each other. Uh, then you also have propagandistic kamishibai. So during the war, there was war propaganda, but even today there's like nationalistic left-wing or religious kamishibai that's still being made. So um, I wanted to broaden the conversation a little bit beyond um, street performance versus educational, because I think um, that there are a lot of tensions around that in Japan, even today. And I thought this was a perfect opportunity to um, remind people of our first couple of um, presenters, Nomashiga Yuki and Araki Fumiko, who really define themselves as being sort of on that continuum between educational and gaito or, or entertainment, um, more entertaining forms of kamishibai. So there are quite a few different performance styles along that continuum or spectrum. And also um, the wonderful work of Mimoto Fumio and um, uh, Tokiwa Hiromi, whoops, who um, are, both products of, sorry about that, the um, tezukuri or handmade kamishibai movement. And let me see if I can get back to them um, because they, um, both of them worked for many years with tezukuri or handmade kamishibai and obviously worked with children creating their own stories, but because their stories were so successful, they were later published. So quite a few of their stories also became published kamishibai. Um, so that is just a brief introduction to everybody. And, and I wanna stop share now so that you can see all of our presenters and um, we can maybe start with some of the questions that came from the audience. Um, so one of the questions now that we have Erica with us, I wanted to ask um, from France, Mary Sharp was really interested in knowing more about your sign language and use of sign language with um, deaf children. And I thought that that also is a nice way of expanding the um, different kinds of kamishibai because I think going into healing and different settings like hospitals is becoming a really important part of kamishibai in a lot of places in the world. Oh, thank you for that question. I. Um... I, as a children's librarian for the past um, 30 years, I like to do, I like to use American Sign Language just because I get nervous and I use my hands a lot. It's mm -hmm. distracting. Don't look at me, like look at my hands. And um, because, uh, you know, um, all the advice about public speaking says, don't just wave your hands around. It's just distracting. Um, so early on, I, um, my sister was learning to be a sign language interpreter. And so I said, oh, I could, I could use that. So it was, it was very self-serving. And, but then when I started doing that in my story times for children at the library, um, what I noticed is that it really helps the younger members of the audience to pay attention just enough like they, they don't get fixated on it, but they will look at it when, when it feels right. And that it's, um, that it's a way to give some focus when it's just words and it, but it's not intrusive when you've got a picture. So, um, so I, started, I started using it at my story time. And then over the past decades, um, it became a bigger movement in libraries to um, help people who were not deaf um, to acquire language in a different format. So there, so it's a it's a thing among children's librarians to um, to use a little bit of sign language in a way that is um, authentic to deaf culture, but not not distracting and not not um, not putting yourself out there as someone who's actually doing interpreting or anything else, but just using a little bit of it, like the way you would put in a word in another language as a way to give people a chance to hear something mm -hmm. or to see something uh, that's just a taste of, of, uh, of another world, you know? So, um, so it's, it's just, it's a side thing that I had been doing. And then when I started doing Kamishibai, I realized that one of the beautiful things about Kamishibai is the picture with no words on the page. 
and that um, that the using sign language signs in whatever language is whatever sign language is in your region. So I am in the United States. It's American Sign Language. If it was in Mexico, it would be Mexican Sign Language. I mean, there's a sign language for every region in the world um, that whichever one, where, wherever you are, you could you could learn a little bit of signs and use that when when it works, when it fits in with whatever other language you're using for your kamishibai. So. Yeah, and um, actually there's another really great example of that as well in Tere um, uh, the, Marichal's video from Puerto Rico. There's a woman who uses sign language. So that does seem to be a really, really effective language with Kamishibai. Um, I think Tere also uses it with deaf children too. Mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. make their own stories and tell their stories through sign language too. Yeah, in a way it's a bridge because you're, you're actually um, performing a story in multiple languages simultaneously if there are deaf people in the audience and they were hearing it. But I'm not, I'm not using it that way because I'm not interpreting. I'm, it's a side thing. It's like a little song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great, great um, tool for the uh, deaf uh, children. Um, one time I, pre um, I exhibited in the uh, American Sign Language um, convention, and I introduced, uh, tried to introduce uh, story card theater. But since I don't know how to do the sign language, I couldn't make very good connection with the attendees very well. So I hope that there will be somebody who can, you know, introduce, you know, widely. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, we had some questions also um, for the publishing side. Um, so I'm going to shift to um, asking uh, David and Hazuki about um, you were talking about the artists you've worked with. Um, and there was a question about profit sharing, how you, um, when you're selling your cards, how that works with the, the artists that you are collaborating with. Do you want to take um, that, Hannah? Or... Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that question? Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, our background was in writing, editing, and marketing. Um, Hazuki worked at a Japanese newspaper in Los Angeles doing advertising sales. Um, I was a magazine editor and a web designer. And so, we sort of had the, also with a, a background in theater. So, we had a, the, text side covered from the, the magazine and advertising work, um, but we, we weren't uh, artists in the sense of uh, creating visual art. And we were thinking in our, our uh, previous video, we described how we got into this by just realizing it was a, just a much more fun way to uh, read books to an audience or read stories to an audience. Um, and we came up with the, uh, the idea that we would start with the Momotaro story and a good friend of ours, who's an exceptional artist, um, had actually drawn several uh, cells of animation for his own Momotaro story. So that was the beginning of the type of collaboration we did where um, we worked with him to plot out the story and divide it into the, uh, the 12 segments that we used. And um, he he did the art to the specifications for, for publishing. And then we went back and forth with the, uh, the text and, and artwork to turn it into a story. And so then Azuki can talk a bit about the, um, how the money side of that worked. So um, every year when I, um, um, I come up with the sales of the year, and then uh, I send out the percentage of that sales to each um, artist as a as royalty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not a you know huge check, but uh, 
as all of our uh, all of us authors know um yeah so um that sort of leads into another question that um uh, i think people will probably have especially if they create their own community by as many of us do do you accept proposals from artists or storytellers who might want to publish with you i think we'd be we'd love to take a look um we can't promise when it would come out and this might be a, a good time to talk about the difference between printing and publishing because people feel um i've done this actually as i have a, a published book and about music uh, when it um comes out when the book is finally published you think that's you've arrived but that's really just the beginning um it'll otherwise uh i know an, <laughs> a self-published author who said he has a million seller because he's got a million of them in his cellar oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's just really the first step you the printing is a mechanical step but then the the whole marketing and sales and distribution and uh, we went uh, at the beginning of uh, we started in 2003 we went to a lot of uh, conferences for education and libraries and just tried to get the word out there because it's such a different type of format um, so yeah and the, the short answer is uh, we've had wonderful time collaborating with uh, with artists and uh with the, the Cat With No Name story, we collaborated on the, the story as well. I think Nina came to us with both the, the text and the, the pictures. And then we went back and forth and did a lot of um, adjustment to turn it into the, the Kamishibai format. Um, but what we really wanted to encourage people to do is just produce your own Kamishibai, whether or not you end up printing it yourself or having someone else print it. But there's just such joy in, in telling your own story whether you're just you know printing out a, a photograph and gluing it onto a card or having your classroom draw pictures that are really meaningful to them or cut out things. Um, so we talked about a, a bit about that in our video, but I think publishing is one way to do it. It's probably not the, the way that, you know, pe that people think it is. <laughs> um, you, you should, I think you should really do it just for the joy of creating something and sharing it. Um, and there are a lot of ways to do that now. Yeah, I think oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. That you um, mentioned in your video was um, um, using more dialogue in the mm -hmm. text of the Kamishibai. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really an important point and something that I miss in a lot of Kamishibai stories that people make themselves. Mm -hmm. um, because Kamishibai are plays and actually in J Japanese, I think the traditionalists call the text of the Kamishibai, you know, the word kyakuhon, Hazuki would know that word, mm -hmm. they're called Scripts and actually, yeah, they're written out as dialogue, you know, um, the, the witch and then what she said, the little boy and then what he said. Um, and we, the, when people make kamishibai, they tend to make it more like a, like a narrative. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's some kamishibai like that too. I mean, even in Japan, but I, the dialogue is so important, and I hope people will go back, you know, to to the roots of Kamishibai and think about that. And I think that's what makes, if it's got really good, lively dialogue, that's what mm -hmm. makes Kamishibai so gripping and exciting for the kids. Yeah, in Very fact, good. some storytellers in Japan only do the dialogue because they mm -hmm. figure that this, the images are doing the rest of the narrative. So that, right, that's right. one way of performing. I'm glad you said that, Donna, because of course you've done the translations for Kamishibai for Kids. So you've worked with the Kyakuhon and translating, translating it into English. Right, um, exactly. And uh, a lot of the Japanese Kamishibai also give stage directions too. Mm -hmm. how, how you should say it um, and uh, to increase how to turn the, the page dialogue. right 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 yeah so they and they give stage directions too mm -hmm. so uh, and it helps when you're when you're narrating especially if you're an amateur um, it gives you some hints about how to 
<laughs> tell more dramatically. One fun thing to try is to not read the words at all. Uh, and you'll notice this with the street <laughs> performers still have the, uh, the stories up here, but they're not back, you know, reading the text on the bottom of the deck. They're just using it as their, you know, their PowerPoint in a way to get the, the feeling and the setting across. And then the, the rest of it is acting. So you can change it up, you know, use the same images and tell a completely different story each time. Yeah, actually, in the history of the street performance artists, um, they didn't have the words written on the back of the cards until I think it was 1938, mm -hmm. because the authorities wanted to control the content. Um, so I always remind people of that, that it is really kind of an oral storytelling form uh, from the beginning. Uh, so that's a great point. I and um, I know that Elizabeth also works in museums and then also have publishers together because I think your work interrelates um, very much and I know traveling around with um, Margaret for many years to conferences in different places to promote Kamishibai librarians have always been our best audience the people <laughs> most interested in incorporating it um, so I'm just wondering and this is really for everybody to respond to um, I feel like as we've looked at different cultures in different countries, Kamishibai has been kind of slow to take off in the US. Um, and I'm just wondering with all the work that we've all been doing over the years, what, what, how would you like to see that change? What can we do to expand um, interest in this art form? I know you, the US is so large, that's one of the, the challenges, but um, if you could kind of reflect on where you'd like to see it go from here. So maybe we can start with Elizabeth and Erica. <laughs> well, I'd love to see it popular enough that we could, or well known enough that we could encourage um, newcomers to showcase their stories. I mean, it would be wonderful if we had the equivalent of the National Storytelling Network Storytelling Festival that's gone on for so many years. And my, my, my experience with Kamishi Bai is that they're, it's very local, that I was so lucky to meet Erica and realize that we had this shared interest. And we have another friend who lives about 30 miles away in Santa Rosa. But, um, but then you know, it's, it's so scattered across the country. Yeah, I feel like um, David and Hazuki and Bob and Margaret might know the names of all the people who do Kamishibai in the United States. <laughs> right. They <probably laughs> bought their stories from you and they're performing them somewhere. Because um, I, when you search to see who's doing Kamishibai, nothing comes up like a museum here, a library there, a handful of places across the country. And yet when, um, when I do it, there'll be someone in the audience saying, oh yeah, we, we had this at our temple or they, they showed us this in our school. And so I have a feeling that there are people in, um, in the United States doing it and they're just not, they're not in some like network. They're not, you know, they're not all linked in mm -hmm. to this thing. So, so I don't know how to judge that. So I think maybe we could hear from the, the people who are sending their boxes out. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, but, the, but so for me, that is, that's the direction that I imagine that um, the teachers, if they, if they were more, if they shared, um, if they shared that more, or if there was more training for teachers, that that would be the way to 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 get the to get the word out. You know, I mean, I know libraries do it, and apparently it's not good enough. So we need a second one. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one point I thought that um, I really wanted uh, the schools to use this tool as um, for the um, like uh, fourth, fifth, sixth graders. Um, and then actually I was thinking like if um, it takes off more like widely, I wanted to do the contest, like, you know, you, you know, Tara, you, you said like a contest for the schools to like uh, make, you know, have kids 
make their own stories and then choose the best one and then you know send it to the <laughs> send it to us or you know somewhere and then you know give them some kind of um recognition mm -hmm. and then that type of contest might like encourage teachers to like uh, do that as a project mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think you know you started this uh webinar i think it's wonderful because more like a wide you know, range of people can join you right so i think you know maybe through this type of um format i think um you can reach out the teachers librarians and then you know have them do some you know use this tool so maybe we can do the you can do the contest here yeah, and contest. then at least you know, they can you know you can invite the winner to uh mm -hmm. invite them and then perform mm -hmm. even though they don't you know publish their own you know, kamishibai. Right. You know, to print the kamishibai, you know, you have to have a big garage space. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the things about um, some kind of contest or, or festival is that one wants to encourage new people to, to, to do their, to create their own kamishibai. And that gives everyone a sense that this is a living art. It's not something quaint that you demonstrate to show what it used to be like in the old days. It's something exciting and can reflect our times as well mm -hmm. as others. Yeah. Yeah, and I think actually that gets to a point that um, um, Bunchan asked Donna recently to write up a little something about the most popular kamishibai for kamishibai for kids. Um, and one of the, the points that I think we need to make also um, is that there's just so many genres of kamishibai that are possible. Um, and in the United States, we mostly have folk tales, which are wonderful. I do a lot of folk tales also. Um, but I think it's given people the impression in the US, and I've been told this, that that's the only genre that kamishibai is good for like folk tales or fantasy um mm. so if if they could have a sense of how many different genres you can find in japan <laughs> certainly at a handmade kamishibai festival it would really open people's minds a lot um, one of the more interesting experiences i had was actually uh, at a programming computer programming conference where i was showing programmers how you can use the concepts of kamishibai to uh, represent data and um so it was, uh, you know, imagine instead of your typical audience of uh, toddlers and uh, young kids, a whole room full of bearded guys with uh, one sock and, you know, it's kind of scribbling furiously. But it, it's, uh, if you think about it, um, there's a very similar format to uh, Kamishibai that's extremely popular and it's used uh, by millions of people every day and that's PowerPoint. And a lot of the um, techniques that I learned doing kamishibai, I use when I have to do a business presentation in PowerPoint, you know, having one strong central image, like uh, here's one of the, you know, and uh, there's just, that's all there is to look at right there. And in the typical PowerPoint, you would have, you know, it'd be like the back of the deck, <laughs> like a thousand <laughs> words on it. And so when you can, convert your presentations, your visual presentations to show something emotional like, like artwork and then keep the, the text concepts in your head. It's just a, a much better way to communicate. So I think it, it might be sort of one of those backdoor approaches where as we talk about this you know, time-tested tradition that you know, brings people to tears sometimes, um, we, I think the best moments for us are after a performance and kids will rush up and hug us. Uh, they've just had such a great time. Um, think, think of your next uh, PowerPoint presentation were like that. Exactly. No, I think that kids who go through a Kamishibai training will be a really different generation of PowerPoint users. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like the Mino Kamishibai festival that they have um, every year and, and then they have the 
the national uh, Zenkoku, which is all Japan festival every other year, you really see how they build a culture of kamishibai over generations of children creating their own stories. Or in the case of the all Japan um, festival, they have the main teachers all come to one place and then all their students come and you see how they've really built this amazing structure um, in Japan for um, growing kamishibai and it, it does get bigger every year. So um, I think you're right on to something that we need to try to to make this um, festival into something that can grow. Mm -hmm. And and um, contests are a way to do that for sure. And well, I have, uh, Bob, I Bob worked with- say something oh, too. Yeah. Okay, let's try Bob. to get Bob in. Bob, Bob, did you want to share something? I was just thinking that Kamishi Bai, there's the immediate story, but in all of our Kamishi Bai, we include a teacher's guide. Mm -hmm. And the teacher's guide is a series of questions that the teacher can ask the kids uh, after they've heard the story. And those questions explore broader themes and behavioral aspects of how the characters behaved in the story. And so what we're trying to teach kids is positive values. Why did the ogre do this? Or why did the uh the moon princess do that and and it explores aspects of human behavior that maybe the kids haven't really thought about and the questions lead, are intended anyway to lead them in new directions to ex expand the scope of their thinking to broaden what they think about and make them a answer questions they haven't even thought about before and that gets back to how creative and how enthusiastic the teacher is about doing the lesson. And we found, this is anecdotal, but a lot of teachers are a little bit, uh, have a little bit of stage fright. They know how to run a classroom in the way they were taught in teacher's college or in, in the uh, education department of whatever college but they're a little bit uncomfortable with themselves as theater performers. And we tell the teachers that, look, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be uh, an expert actress or you don't have to be uh, in advanced theater uh, mode. The kid just wants you to enthusiastically read the story and then be enthusiastic about exploring the questions in the teacher's guide with them. And I think if if teachers do that and librarian and that it can flip over to the librarians doing uh, performances in the library and you get a bunch of kids and then you ask them the same kinds of questions. And it could be a springboard to learning a lot about a lot of things. Not, it's, it's not just a fantasy story. And I don't, I don't mean to imply that Tara was saying that it was, it was just fantasy, but sometimes fantasy can be a way of exploring reality. And what Absolutely. are we what's going <laughs> on? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, no, absolutely, Bob. Um, I have to be mindful of the time a little bit, um, and I wanted to get a couple more questions in, but thank you so much for that, that comment, Bob. And, and I, I, I absolutely agree with you that, that entertainment and education are not obviously separate right. things. Um, but I, I wanted to ask Elizabeth a little bit more about museums, um, since we haven't touched on them as much. Um, to, could, as we're talking about how to develop a culture of kamishibai in the U.S., can you see that that will spread more to um, museum spaces, or or how do you envision that happening? Well, there really there there are museums all across the country that do use kamishibai. Um, I I think that one thing to point out that is an additional challenge for Kamishibai for to establishing Kamishibai in the United States is that there is not as current a tradition of storytelling as there and, and continuous a tradition of storytelling 
as there is in many, many other countries. So that, that one of the slight disconnects is that the children who tend to come to special programs at museums, special storytelling, including Kamishi by programs at museums and libraries tend to be young and probably not ready to really create their own Kamishi mm. by. And, and that's just something, I mean, for, for I've been a I've been a librarian for over 40 years and started was fortunate enough to start just as the renaissance of oral storytelling was starting up again and um it, it is a wonderful thing but it's not something it's still something that you have to convince the middle grade audience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to enjoy Right, right. Yeah, I think we also noticed that in, in um, the various uh, performances that come out of Europe and, and South America, Central America, that there's a the deep um, theater traditions there and puppetry. And a lot of people come to Kamishibai from that background, uh, which we don't have maybe as strongly in the US. Um, I think also before we end, we only have a few minutes, but um, David, you had brought um, the uh, cards that you just recently made in three languages. And um, I think Donna wanted you to share that with the audience, if you have them there. Thank you. This is, um, we've done uh, four, we've published four books so far, one in the second edition. Um, they were all based on folk tales. This one um, was more of a family tradition. This is um, uh, an original story uh, illustrated by our son. And when since we are, we're starting completely from scratch on this, we, we uh, thought we'd try some different things. And one was to uh, do it in uh, three languages. We've got uh, English, Japanese, and Spanish. We, um, when we were touring around to uh, schools um, and we talk about having bilingual cards, they say, oh, English and Spanish, at, at least in California. Um, so that was something that we got a, a big request for as, as we were developing the cards. Eric, yeah, that's what, yeah. Eric, do you also happen to have your cards? I mentioned something that you use to teach Spanish. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think she's muted. <laughs> Can I mention something else? Okay, quickly. Um, which is that um, I want people to, to appreciate the fact that the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco has an incredibly well-developed storytelling program mm -hmm. so that they, they've got an education department that trains new storytellers every two or three years and markets this storytelling program to teachers. In fact, we're doing Zoom storytelling to teachers all over the country and in some some other countries during the pandemic so that th there's a um you know developing a program like that takes a lot of ongoing commitment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly that's building the culture as you yeah. said before and erica you have your cards ready i think <laughs> yeah, it was it was a uh, what I mentioned in the in the video. So these are the cards. They're they're on black cardstock, and I um, painted on them in white, and then with glow in the dark paint. But the glow in the dark paint <laughs> does doesn't really show up in the dark. <laughs> I'm not going to show you. So there's um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. You, can, a fun. You, can, you can kind of see the glow in the dark one looks a little like green. And um, do do you know this song? I should I sing it or no? Um, yeah, let's give it give us a little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, as you can see, it's going through. So I am gonna start with. Um, <clears throat> let me let me start with one more. Okay, here's. Um, so I'm starting with like the fifth verse. Uh, so um, Juanito cuando baila, 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 Juanito cuando baila, baila con la carrera, con la carrera, derra, derra. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, wait. 
<risa> la carrera de la tierra con las piernas, 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 con la rodilla, día, día, con el pie, 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 con el dedito, dito, dito, así va la Juanito. So, and you add one more body part each time. So, each time you sing, you're singing for longer. And when this is in the Kamishi by box, the stage, then I can dance. <laughs> but since I have to stand here in front of the camera, it doesn't work. But in real life, then everybody stands up and we all dance together. So that, um, you know, oh, I, I got tired of drawing this skeleton over and over. So I put two on the same page, gives me a chance to not switch. And then there's the shoulders, los hombros. La, los okay, wait, this is very hard to do it this way. I like my box. Then uh, you're you're about to see the whole thing, mm -hmm. just because I like I like that like a base. Oh yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> that and then, very cool. And then yeah. todo, todo el cuerpo, and that's the end. <laughs> it is a wonderful way to teach language, um, and I I think. Uh, all of you in different ways have shown that this evening. So thank you. Uh, oh, we are out of time. We have lots of comments in the chat section. I haven't been keeping you up. Yeah, I thank everybody for, for adding so many comments. This is great. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we can save them and um, share them with all of you if you haven't had a chance to look at them. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time. And as Margaret always says to me when we end a conversation, this is to be continued uh, because this is really just the beginning, I think, in the US of, of continuing and actually growing this culture here. And um, you all have contributed wonderful ideas for that. And I think our audience ongoing as they watch this webinar and our archive um, will contribute more ideas and and grow this movement. So thank you all very much for joining us tonight. And can we remind people who may have joined later about next the next webinar? Yes, so that will be April 17th. And because our panelists will be from Europe, we are starting it at a different time. Um, we will be starting it at one o'clock on the west coast of the US, um, four o'clock on the east coast of the US, and that will be around 10 in um, Europe so that they don't have to do it in the wee hours of the morning. So we hope all of you can join us for the next one as well. I have um, panelists from Switzerland and um, Slovenia. 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 <laughs> Great. Well, it was wonderful to see all of you. Um, there's obviously so much to talk about and so little time. So I hope we can do this again soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Hey, okay. everyone. Talk soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.